Welcome to Wednesday night. Uh, thank you, uh, Grace Chapel, for supporting the Guzman family on Sunday. Uh, I believe we have a heart for missions. God's going to bless us. And again, I want to thank the Guzman family for coming out Sunday. Really enjoyed having them. Talented family going to Scotland. <clears throat> and again, I believe God blesses um, the work of, the, of a missionary. And I believe that God blesses the work uh, of a church that is able to support them. And again, thank you for a very important step of our church. You watch how God will, will work in that way. So uh, let's <clears throat> go ahead and get you, get right into the lesson here tonight. Um, again, this is Wednesday night here. Um, just looking forward to Sunday. Working on the message right now. Uh, I think uh, it's going to be enjoyable. Uh, by the way, um, Stacy Desal will not be, we're not going to do the teleconference this Sunday. It's got pushed to the 31st. Uh, the reason being he had a conflict of uh, scheduling. So uh, we will um, have him on the 31st. So anyway, looking forward to that. If you have your Bibles, go over to 2 Corinthians chapter 2. 2 Corinthians chapter 2. We're going to verse, read verses 1 through 7 uh, here. This could be a little longer message than normal, but uh, just bear with me. Something that we I think we need to hear tonight. Uh, the Bible says, But I determined that this myself, that I would not come again to you in heaviness. For if I make you sorry, who is he then that maketh me glad? But the same which makes me sorry by me. And I wrote the same unto you, lest uh, when I came, I, I should have a sorrow for them of whom ought to rejoice, having confidence in all of you, or in all of you all, uh, that joy is the joy of you all. For out of affliction and anguish of heart I wrote unto you with many tears, not that, I, that, we she, that ye shall be grieved, but that ye shall might know the love which uh, I have more abundantly unto you. But if any have caused grief, and he had not grieved me, but in part, that I may not overcharge you all, sufficient to all men that this man, uh, uh, sufficient to such a man is this punishment to which afflicted of many. So, so that contrary, that you ought to rather to forgive him and comfort him, lest perhaps that one should be swallowed up, up with over, over much sorrow. Now, what in the world is Paul telling the Church of Corinthians here. Well, the Bible says, Lest Satan shall take advantage of us, for we are ignorant of his devices. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, or sorry, sorry 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11. To grasp the victory, we must know the strong points of what he's talking about. Listen, for you to win a game, you must know your opponent. Uh, before you go into a, a football game, there's hours and hours of tape. That's being done by the coaches. If you watch football, if you know, uh, I'm a big football fan and go Bears. But you know, if if the Washington Redskins were playing the Dallas Cowboys, there's always a game plan. They know the intricacies of what Tony Romo is going to do. They know the offensive line. They know how they block. They know how the defense is going to prepare against the offensive quarterback. They look at all these game films. They know their opponent. Well, I'm going to tell you this right now. Christians fail, Christians lose in today's world is because they don't respect nor they do not understand their opponent. And who's their opponent? Well, it's Satan. And I'm going to tell you, Satan is powerful. And you cannot defeat Satan yourself. You have to have the power of God in your life. And what happens is we don't understand how Satan works sometimes. Sometimes, even, believe it or not, Satan uses us in a way we might be unconscious or subconsciously not even knowing how Satan uses us. Satan is a very powerful spirit. And he does things uh, that, uh, you know, that go against what um, the things of God is and the will of God. Satan is not like what's going on at, um, at, um, at um, Grace Chapel. He does not like what's going on, how we started the church. He does not like uh, seeing souls get saved. He does not like seeing people get get excited about things with God, and I promise you Satan's going to come attacking. And it may be through people that come in those doors, it may be even through us in, internally of fighting and bickering, but I want to give us some, some examples tonight of exactly how Satan works and what Satan does to, to, to destroy his people. How does Satan use, quote-unquote, devices against God and against us? Well, number one, let me tell you, and this happens all the time, he uses disappointment. He uses disappointment in our life. We've all been disappointed, haven't we? 
We've all been disappointed with people. We've all been disappointed with uh, just actions of the way things are. And, you know, and, and I'm going to tell you this right now. God never disappoints us. Amen? There's nothing that God has ever done that's disappointed us. God never disappoints. But Satan does. And he brings uh, disappointment uh, into our life. But I want to remind you what Romans chapter 8, verse 28 says. Let me, let me turn right there, and I want to quote this verse of Scripture perfectly. Uh, Romans chapter 8, uh, verse 28, the Bible says, For we all know, uh, and we all know, all things work to good to them that love God, and to them that are called according to His purpose. Boy, isn't that good? God does things in our life that we may seem disappointing to us, but we've got to remember God has a plan. Also, Satan works through discouragement, not only dis disappointment, but through discouragement. Discouragement is a stage that happens after, disappoint after disappointment happens. Disappointment leads to discouragement. The Bible says, fear not, neither be discouraged. Our brethren have discouraged our heart. You know, I, 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 I've personally, and you know, we've helped uh, minister and, and talk to different people through discouragement and disappointment that's happened in their life here in the last year or so. And what happens is, again, Satan just loves to just bring, his, bring people down in the dirt. You know, people were once rode high on the mountain, and, and we thought that, hey, it can't get any better than this. And the next thing you know, they're in the mud, sucking, uh, sucking wind. And, uh, you know, again, that's, again, Satan utilizing uh, and taking advantage of a, the opportunity to discourage. Because, you know, let me tell you something. D discouraged, disappointed Christians are not effective. And there's a bitterness that takes place in their heart. And they don't have that one's joy and zeal to do things for God. And that's exactly what Satan wants to do. They also just, he also um, uses despair in our life. This is another stage that happens after disappointment and discouragement. It, it can destroy, despair can destroy a Christian. Despair uh, is, is, is to forget. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, I want you to turn there with me, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, Verse 8, the Bible says, We are troubled on every side, ye not distressed, we are perplexed, but not in despair. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed, but we are perplexed, but not in despair. Despair is to forget that God is working in our life. Boy, sometimes we do forget the things of God, the blessings of God in our life. We forget how God literally is on our side, and God is omnipresent. He's, he's everywhere, and sometimes we forget about His presence. Many churches forgot what it really means to be in the presence of God. And I pray that in our life and in our Christian life, not only inside the church but outside the church, we never forget that God is with us. After despair comes doubt, uh, Satan attacked Eve in the Garden of Eden uh, with doubt. He questioned the Word of God. He, and he, uh, he questioned Eve's heart. And, and, she, and he got her to doubt God's Word. He said, the Bible says in Genesis chapter 3, verse 1, the Bible says, he said to the woman, yea, hath God said? Well, that's right there. Hath God said with a question. Ye have not shall eat of every tree of the garden? Question mark. The second we start questioning the things of God and the word of God, we become spiritually really in trouble. Doubt is to forget, uh, doubt is to, forget to pray, and doubt is to, forget, is to forget in 1 Timothy, I will therefore pray, uh, that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without the wrath and doubting. The Bible, God even specifically calls upon, listen, do not doubt me. Do not doubt my power. Do not doubt my word. That's why there's so many different versions of the Bible out there. It's because somebody started doubting that this is truly the word of God. And now we've got uh, you know, multiple versions of the Bible out, out, outstanding. It literally is heresy uh, in, in, our, in our doctrine. It's because way back when, in, in, in the Garden of Eden, Satan used uh, the device of doubt against Eve. And, and again, Satan uses that to Christians to doubt their salvation and, and, and all, these, all these different things. Now with doubt comes disbelief. Disbelief is the final form of doubt. Uh, Genesis 3, um, chapter, chapter, uh, ver, um, sorry, chapter 3, verses 4 and 5, to disbelieve is to forget. Uh, Hebrews chapter 3, verse 12, and the Bible says, Take heed, brethren, lest there be any of you in the evil of the heart of disbelief or unbelief in departing in the living word in, in, in the living God. Boy, I tell you, I just heard um, something happen to a real dear friend of ours. 
uh, wanted us to pray uh, for her son is because he has gone through these stages of discouragement, disappointment, uh, and then uh, you have um, uh, you know, despair, and then doubt, and then disbelief. And it, it breaks my heart because what happens is, again, being, being a young Christian, you fall susceptible to all these different things. Even being a, a mature Christian, we all fall susceptible to these things. Satan is so powerful today. And, 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 and it, do we get to the point we disbelieve? Yeah, we actually do. We can get to the point of disbelief. That's when we start doing our own things. Because we don't believe that God can take care of that situation. And, and, and again, it's very dangerous when we get to that point. Then also Satan brings this thing called distraction in our life. Uh, distractions. Um, you know, we could get sidetracked on God's plan. Maybe you were called to do something for God in the ministry. And then you've been distracted along the way. Uh, you were down the road of following God's will, but yet something distracted you. Whatever it may be, you something. it could be anything that you put before God. And, and, and again, that's how Satan works. The Bible says in uh, Matthew chapter 14, verse 30, But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid and began to sink. He cried unto the Lord, say, saying, Save me. What happened was, Peter went out on the boat, and then the waves came and come cr crashing in, a great storm, and Jesus was walking on the water, and there he sees Jesus uh, you know, uh, in, in the distance, and Peter, when he looked at Christ, he started walking on water. But as soon as he started looking around at the distractions and how big the waves were and how uh, bad that storm was, he started to sink. He kept his eyes off Christ. And again, that's the distractions that Satan likes to bring. He, he wants you to pay attention to all the other things in our life besides God. And I'm going to tell you what's distracting us today. I'm going to be honest with you. Social media. You know, Facebook, the, the, you know, the, the Twitters and all these different things. And you don't believe me. Here, I'm going to tell you this is what we do. We get, on it, we get it uh, to our dinner table or we get even at, at restaurants and everybody's doing this. We're in church. Everybody's doing this. What it is this? Hey, you know, listen, uh, you know, I, of anybody, listen, live my life through this phone. But let's be honest. This is a distraction in my life. A lot of times, this is a distraction. And it's exactly what Satan tries to use sometimes to get my mind away from the things of God. And also, what happens is, another thing that Satan uses is double-mindedness. Now, what in the world does that mean? The Bible says a double-minded man, uh, in the Greek, means double-souled. You can't hold hands with this world and hold hands with God at the same time. Uh, there's, a, there's many different... Uh, um, uh, verses of scripture, one of which is a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. And that's in the book of James. Draw nigh on the God, and he will draw nigh on to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purf purf purify your hearts, ye double-minded. What is, what is he trying to say here? Listen, he's trying to get you focused back you know, on the things of God. You cannot, again, come to church on Sunday and call yourself a Christian, raising holy hands, singing the Psalms, singing, you know, and, and, and shouting amen, and then going out in the world and doing worldly things on a consistent basis is ridiculous. It's a double-minded man and double-souled. And God wants to get your attention and focus back on him. Satan loves double-minded people. And, and again, it's, it's just not the things of God. It's the device of Satan that he loves to do. Also brings dishonesty. Satan loves dishonesty. And I'm going to tell you, I've been in positions inside churches where I considered men of God and I considered, I considered mentors of my life be dishonest. Businessmen be dishonest. Uh, you know, pastors be dishonest. There's nothing more disheartening as a Christian being under a ministry of a dishonest man who I put uh, up, up, up highly. But i got to understand, too, this, this man puts his pants on like you and me. We, you know, we can be decided by lying or cheating or holding certain facts back. I mean, just little white lies that we talk about. It's being dishonest. Uh, we're looking at uh, ministries right now of these big faith healers. There's a stat that came out that said these people that get on TV, these faith healers and everything else, that these it's become a $500 million business. That's ridiculous, all on based on dishonesty, and Satan is laughing all the way to the bank uh, about it. Uh, for 2 Corinthians 4.2 uh, here says, uh, but have renowned and hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in the crappiness, nor handling of the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. There are many people out there that are trying to teach this word and preach this word on a dishonest basis, and that's exactly what Satan wants. He also wants deceit. 
uh, deceit. Uh, the Bible says, with all deceitfulness of unrighteousness. For we are not as many uh, which are corrupt by the word of God. Therefore, seeing we have a ministry, we have uh, received mercy, we, we faint not, but remound the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in the craftiness, nor handling the word deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves and every conscience in the sight of God. For many deceivers are entered into the world, the Bible says in Second John 1, 7. How do we know when there's deceit? Well, sometimes you just don't. Sometimes Satan, again, puts the blindfolds on, and sometimes we fall for the tricks. We've got to be careful. <coughs> Something I want to talk to you about real, real quick about is dullness. Satan loves churches that you hear crickets in the background. When you come to the house of God and the preacher is nothing but a six-foot icicle behind the pulpit, that's exactly what Satan wants. Satan is literally killing Christians because of dullness. There's no excitement for the things of God. I'm going to tell you, we've got to get, listen, you say, well, we don't want emotionalism into our churches. I say hogwash. Hog, listen, emotional, listen, coming to the house of God ought to be emotional. Let your emotions flow, that's fine. But it better be of God. We gotta get excited about coming to the house of God. We gotta be excited about doing the things of God. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter five, verse twelve through fourteen, for when a time ye ought to be teachers, ye have uh, ye have need of to teach you again with the, with the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become the servant in need of the milk, not of strong meat. The dullness is affecting the churches, especially in Corinth, right here. We talked about. The Bible says, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you, uh, for as unto spiritual, but as carnal, even unto the babes of Christ. And I have fed you with the milk, not the meat. To hitherto there is one among you, or there is among you, envying strife, divisions, and carnal, and as walk among men. Suffer dullness. Listen, when we, when we suffer dullness, uh, also we, we look at Hebrews chapter 5, verse 11. The Bible says, Of whom we have many things to say, have to be uttered, seeing ye are dull of hearing. Preacher's job is to preach the gospel. It's your job to come prepared with a heart of excitement and a zeal to, to receive that word. The word is not; it should not be coming from man. It should be the things of God. You will be excited about hearing the things and and, and, and and being excited to hear the gospel of, of God. With dullness comes deadness. Let me tell you. You know, you're dead. You stink. That's plain and simple. Deadness means an unchecked dullness. Don't be dead. Like the church of Sardis was considered dead. The Bible says, "I know not. Uh, I know that works. That thou, thou has a living, or uh, has a name. That thou livest and are dead. I would not want God to come in and Jesus Christ to come in my church, into into Grace Chapel, and 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 I don't care what church I'm in. And He walks down the aisle and He looks. He says, Greg Nosar, this is a dead church. Woo! There is. I don't think there's anything more worse than having that." It, it, you know, coming in and saying that this is a dead church. What are we doing for Christ to make being alive? What are we doing when people come in? Are we alive today? And that really it has to do with our attitude. Also, uh, Satan uses uh, defaming God's name. The Bible says, "How often are Christians guilty of Chris?" Uh, well, I'm sorry. Uh, the Bible says here in um, uh, uh, let's see, it's in Psalm 101:5. The Bible says, "Whosoever privily slanders his neighbor, him I will cut off." Him that, high, uh, the, him that hath an high look proud of the heart, I will not suffer. That's exactly what he's talking about here. We have got to be careful about defaming ourselves and defaming others. There's always, um, you know, brother and sister blabbermouth going around just wanting to just talk bad about people all the time. And they're defaming themselves, but at the same time, if they're Christians and they're uh, fellow uh, people of God, they're also defaming God. And, 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 and the things of God. Listen, we understand that people can be disappointing and all that stuff. But listen, we're really when we when we bring each other down, we're really bringing down the work of God, and we got to be careful of that that creates discord. That's another thing that happens. How many times have you been in the church? There's been nothing but discord. Enough said, right? We've all been there. Uh, the Bible says uh, these six things that the Lord hate. Ye are seven of the abomination unto him, a proud look, a lying tongue, the hands of the shed of innocent blood, a heart that dis, uh, deceiveth. Uh, the visest, the wicked imaginations, feet to be swift in the running of mischief, a false witness, speaketh lies, and he that, dis and he that soweth discord among the brethren. Boy, I tell you, you know, let me, let me be honest with you. Men are worse than ladies when it comes to this. 
men have this little arrogance and pride about it when it comes to sowing discord because it's about pride. It's about getting, listen, men will jump on top of men to get to the highest ladder just to do a little brown nosing to the person who's either the pastor or the head deacon to get to their position because they want it so bad. They'll, they'll, they'll bring another man down to get what they want. And I'm going to tell you, that's why we don't have any hierarchies here. <laughs> that's why we don't want any of that mess here at, at, um, at Grace Chapel is because we don't want discord among the brethren trying to reach a certain pinnacle and goal in, our, in their lives. We don't want any part of that. Another thing he uses is this defilement. Defilement. You know, the defilement. You know, we, uh, um, uh, Mike Guzman preached on have, being a clean vessel and getting rid of the impurities in our life. And again, one of the things that Satan loves to do is take a, a clean thing and make it dirty. He wants that oil to be uh, defiled. And we've got to be careful in our, in our hearts and our minds that we not, uh, even in our bodies, that we not defile it. Listen, uh, you know, again, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16 and 17, the Bible says, Know ye not the thing that ye are a temple of God, the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God... Him shall, him shall God destroy. The temple of God is holy, which the temple ye are. Now, here's, here's what I'm talking about here. Listen. Uh, it's no secret. I'm not the skinniest person in the world. I'm not the healthiest person in the world. But boy, that tell you what, that challenges me. Because you know, what am I doing? Uh, you know, when we're smoking cigarettes and, and we're drinking alcohol, not we, but you know, when people are going out and doing those things... Um, when, you, when we put a cigarette in our mouth, okay, or if you're taking a sip of alcohol, what are you doing? Is, is, it, is it a sin? Why is it a sin? Because you know what it's going to do? It's going to defile our bodies. How can we be effective if we're on a hospital bed? Also, too, let's, be, let's just be honest. When we're not taking our care of ourselves and our blood pressure's up and our cholesterol's up and we can't breathe and we can't walk, we don't have the right exercise, we don't have the right nutrition, we're way overweight. I'm looking, listen, I'm talking about myself here. What are we doing? We're defiling our bodies, aren't we? And I believe one of the things, again, because God wants us to use our, our body as a holy temple unto Him. It's, it, we're, we're filled of spiritual, emotional, right, and um, in, in a physical form. That's those three things God gives us. If we don't take care of our bodies, how are we going to be effective for the Lord? Boy, that's a whole other message. But again, I believe Satan uses defilement uh, as, as a point to just get us off track and, and not do the things of God. The Bible, another thing that he uses too is discontent. The problem with people that jump around from church to church to church is because they, they're discontent. They, they're not content in anything. Uh, you know, they think that there's always the grass is greener on the other side. I, always, I, listen, I don't want to say this, but you know what? Hey, the dog uses the bathroom in every yard. You know what I mean? There's dog poop everywhere. Let's just be honest with you. I mean, you know, when we jump from job to job to job, or we jump from church to church to church, if we are not careful, we become discontent in the things of God. That's why, that's why, listen, that's why marriages get destroyed. It's because people are not content with what their promises and oath before God was. Uh, that's why people go from job to job to job and change churches. It's because we're not, we're, we're not content. The Bible says, be content in such things ye have. Uh, and he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Aren't you glad that God is not discontent with us, even though when we do things against him? Another thing Satan uses is delay. Delay. I've seen many people, many men, of, many men and women delay the decision for salvation. They think they have another Sunday. They think they have another day, another month, another year to give their life unto Christ. I mean, you know those people. You have them in your family. You have them as friends. They're delaying salvation because they don't truly want to give their life unto Christ. I believe that, thing, that, thing, that delay is of Satan. The Bible says, I made haste and delay not to keep thy commandments. Boy, I tell you what, that right there alone has sent many people to hell because they think they have time, and they don't. Another thing Satan uses is disobedience. We can go on and on and on about that, 
Uh, we can look about the children of Israel being disobedient unto God. We can look at, uh, you know, how um, even in the New Testament there's, uh, you know, people that have run from God. And, and we, we can talk about idolatry and talking about all these different things. I'll just give you this quick verse. The Bible says in Romans chapter 6, the Bible says, uh, For sin... Uh, for sin shall not have dominion over you, but the, uh, but uh, being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. Boy, disobedience. If we could just really consistently obey God, that would really make Satan mad. And you know, and again, boy, I tell you, that's one thing we want to stay clear of is is um, being disobedient to God, especially when it comes to spiritual things at, at Grace Chapel. We better be really on His page and on His timing. To make sure that we do do um, do His will. Lastly, I want to give this to you, and thank you for being patient. I know this is a longer message than usual. Is debt, debt, debt has held so many good men of God and so many families doing great things for God is because Satan has imprisoned them with debt. And I'm gonna tell you, you know, it's 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 it's. Um, I'll give you I'll give you this. The Bible says the rich ruler is over the poor. The borrower is the servant of the lender. Is a servant of the lender. Every time that you sign a mortgage, every time that you sign a car loan, every time you do a credit card, you become a servant, a slave, literally under, underneath the lender. You work your fingers to the bone just to get yourself out of debt. There's people that miss church on Sundays because they have to work to get themselves out of debt. There's people that wants to do things greatly under God, uh, for God, maybe travel, maybe go out and be a missionary, but they can't because they're a servant under debt. It, these are different devices that Satan uses. We, it's just one of those lessons we just, we just need to take heed over uh, tonight and just kind of just, hey, I hope you learned a little bit of things. But, you know, these are things that we have to be careful of because we really want to be effective and, and used by God. Uh, in, in, a, in a tremendous, tremendous way, we got to know our enemy. I want to win the Super Bowl. I want to be victorious in my life. But before I get on that battlefield, before I get on the football field, before I strap on that helmet, before I put my shoulder pads on, before I strap in those gloves, I better know who my enemy is and what he does and how he keeps people down. I want to fight the good fight. I want to be on the battlefield. I want to continue to play. I want to play coach. I want to play coach. I want to play coach. We'll get in the film room. Learn what Satan does. Learn what our enemy does so that we're not under the snares of him. God bless you. Thank you for your attention. We'll see you Sunday.